Praise God. We're going to get into the Word here in just a few moments, and then shortly following that, we're going to flood this place with prayer, believing God to do amazing things this fall. How many know our God is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine? How many understand that truth tonight? Amen? And so we're going to believe for that as we walk these hallways uh, church, just to give you an idea of, of what he's already up to in our service this morning and in our children's church service, we had three individuals give their lives to Christ. I'm thankful for that. I believe he deserves a hands of clap of praise. Amen. And uh, God is already on the move. And we're going to be talking about a familiar passage of scripture here in just a moment. And that will give us instruction regarding our prayer time tonight. But as we begin this evening, we're going to look at a familiar story, a story where Jesus was talking to someone that really he wasn't supposed to be talking to according to the cultural standard of that day. He was engaged in a conversation with someone that no one else would have really paid attention to. He was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. He was the Son of God. She was living in a life of sin. And the fact that these two were even speaking to one another was a miracle in and of itself in that day. But Jesus wasn't concerned about the social barriers that might have been placed upon this situation. He was concerned for this woman's, for this person's spiritual condition. In this moment, the disciples were gone. They had gone into town to purchase food. So it was just Jesus and this individual. And when the disciples returned, Scripture tells us that they were surprised to see him talking to her. They were surprised that this conversation had been taking place. In their minds, it was a cultural violation. It was a social mistake. Has anybody ever made like a social mistake? Tom's hand went up like immediately, right? You, 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 you go against the trends or whatever. Anyway, Jesus did not hesitate to minister to this person at this time. He was on this earth to do the will of the Father. He was here to give his life as a ransom for many. And what we see throughout his ministry and even in this situation is that Jesus took hold of every single opportunity that he had to share his love with others. Why? Because he knew the time was short. He knew the field or the fields were white, meaning they were ready for harvest. We know the story and the passage that it leads up to. Well, Jesus gives his confused disciples in this moment a very clear and urgent message. And we find that message in John chapter 4, verse 35. He says, Don't you have a saying? that it's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. What Jesus was telling them in this moment was the time had come for them to take to the field and to bring in the harvest that was ready to be brought in. It was not a season of waiting or, or wandering of what was coming next. It was not a season of planning and preparing. The season had now arrived. The time was now, church, and Jesus was not about to miss out on this opportunity to minister to this individual. When we look at the story of the woman at the well, the woman was living in a life of sin, and she is so excited after her talk with Christ that she runs into town and tells everybody that they need to come out and check out this guy. And in response to what she tells them, much of the town comes out and believes, places their faith in Jesus. Now, what if, for a moment, let's just kind of play this out in our imaginations. What if Jesus would have settled for the excuses? What if Jesus would have given in to the cultural trends? What if Jesus, in his weary state from his traveling, uh, simply asked for a cup of water and didn't do anything else in that situation? He was tired. It'd been a long day. I've never had any days like that where I go home and I'm tired and ready to put my feet up. Anybody ever never had one of those days? Christina says no. 
None of you, you guys are youth over here. You guys, you never get tired, right? No, they just shake their heads. That's all right. No, it was tired. It had been a long day. He could have he just kind of brushed off this time and said, no, nah, not today. I mean, she was a different nationality. They were not supposed to speak to each other according to the, again, the culture. She was living in sin, was a little too friendly with the fellas. She might have mistaken Jesus' conversation for something else. Yada, yada, yada. We can go on and we can go on and we can go on. Jesus could have settled for these and other excuses, but instead, church, he chose to do something else. He chose to share with her the truth because he knew that time was short, that now was the time for harvest. Not in a few moments, not a couple of days from now. It wasn't anybody else's responsibility. This opportunity had been brought to him in that moment. The fields were ready to go, and this was that moment or window of opportunity. In church, I would declare to you tonight, the fields are indeed white, ready for harvest tonight. Much like what we see in Jesus' day, the harvest is ready to be brought in. And we know that just in a few short days, our buses will be back on the road. Praise God. Looking forward to seeing all four of those vehicles back out, picking up students, and our midweek services will be back in full operation. We have been praying. We have been fasting. We have been anticipating what God is going to do in the days, weeks, and months to come, church. And now the time has come to roll up our sleeves and to enter into that mission field. Church, this is our opportunity. This is the season that God has placed and led us to, or placed in front of us and led us to. And I pray that we will not settle for excuses. I pray that we won't look at the trends or look at different things that would keep us from engaging in what God has called us to do. I pray that instead we would answer the call that the fields are white, ready for harvest, and we would take to the fields. In this moment tonight, I believe we are going to see God do some amazing things. But such a declaration requires a dedication on our part. We need to be fully dedicated to the harvest. We cannot settle for any excuse and expect the job to get done. We must take to the fields, do the work that is necessary, tear down any walls that might hinder us socially or emotionally, and with the guidance and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we need to work to lead the lost back to Jesus. And I realize tonight that this church is very familiar with the concept of harvest. I mean, our building is literally surrounded by corn and soybean fields tonight. Harvest is not a foreign idea. To us. So we know this truth all too well that the harvest is not going to bring itself in. Amen. Bob, how many times have you and Janny just kicked your feet up at home and thought, well, the wheat, it'll just show up in the grain bins tomorrow? Never. Zero, he says, right? Somebody's got to get in the field and do the work. And so tonight, as we pray, as we ask God to do something amazing in this place and on these grounds, I'm going to ask you to ask God to do something amazing in you as well as we make the commitment to be the workers in the field and to bring in the harvest tonight. Tonight we dedicate this building and these grounds for the purpose of bringing in that harvest. Tonight we push aside any and all excuses, any and all attitudes that might hinder us from doing exactly what God has called us to do. And in this story, when we look at that, I would encourage you to read this story in full uh, this evening after service. But in this story, in the moment that the disciples come back on the scene, they begin to question Jesus because his actions did not line up with their skewed expectations. I can only imagine that the disciples were maybe thinking, let someone else deal with her, or why are you talking with her or uh, to this woman? Uh, maybe asking the question, what do you want? Look at verse 27 of chapter 4 to see their thoughts. They struggled to see the need that was truly right in front of them. She needed a Savior, and the Savior was there. And I would hope tonight 
that if I were physically walking with Jesus as these disciples were, that I would go or that I would be beyond eager to introduce him to everyone I knew and didn't know. What do I mean by that? Have you ever been in the presence of somebody, uh, an acquaintance, a family member, or something that you are excited to introduce to others? Donna, I've got, man, this is, this is Joe over here. And I mean to tell you, Joe is an awesome guy, and I cannot wait for you guys to get to know each other. I mean, there, there's these, these moments where maybe we, we uh, whatever the reason uh, is, but we're excited to introduce who it is that we're with to the individual. I, I would hope that as a, uh, a disciple of Jesus, in that close of proximity with Christ, that my excitement of, of knowing who he was and, and what he had come to this earth to do, that I wouldn't be able to stay silent, that everybody that's walking down the street is, have you met this guy yet? I mean, come on, Gary. This is Jesus. Do you, let me tell you who this guy, Jesus, come over here. Let me talk to my new friend Gary over here. I, I would hope that that excitement would be there. Amen. Although Jesus is not physically walking with us tonight, he is with us each and every day. How many know that this evening, Amen. that his Holy Spirit is with us each and every day, and he is leading us to make the most of every opportunity that we have to talk about him. Why? Because the harvest is ready, and it's time to bring it in. So tonight, here in just a few moments, we're going to turn on some music. We'll have the prayer points on the screen behind us the, uh, and on the TVs throughout the building. The prayer points are also taped to the doors of our classrooms, to the buses and such. And I'm going to ask us to pray along some specific lines tonight as we believe God for amazing things this fall. Before we send the buses and before we fill the rooms, I pray that we ask God to fill this place with his presence in preparation for the harvest that is coming in. Our prayers tonight are prayers of faith. Amen? And I believe we won't have room enough, church. I, I believe we won't have room enough in our buses for the harvest that is getting ready to come. I, I pray tonight that we won't have chairs enough for the harvest that is... Is anybody else getting on board with me tonight? I, I believe we won't have classrooms enough for the harvest that is getting ready to come in. But in order for that harvest to come in, we must go out and do the work. Jesus is sending us out to bring in the lost. And I want us to consider this one more point as we get to the prayer points. In the story out of John chapter 4, who was it that Jesus used to bring the harvest in that day? The Samaritan woman who was deeply entrenched in sin. And consider this too. In his conversation with her, he gave her the truth. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't try to you know, go through pleasantries and different things. He spoke truth to her. And when she went to tell the town about Jesus... I want you to see her words in verse 29 and 30. Look what he or what she tells the town. Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. She had a pretty interesting history, to say the least. Jesus called out that history. But he did so in a lovingly way, a lovingly way. He did not want to embarrass her. He wasn't trying to condemn her. He was trying to set her free. And in this moment, as she goes back to the town, she opens up with a, see a man who told me everything I ever did? Could this be the Messiah? And so the town came out and made their way toward him. I'm sure she had heard everything before. But that day she heard the truth. That day she heard the truth. The town believed her. And after coming to see Jesus, they believed in Jesus. So prayer point number one is, Lord, help us to communicate the truth that is your word with love and compassion. May your truth set hearts free. May this place be a place where the truth of Jesus can be found, church. Amen. Secondly, Jesus told the disciples that his priority was to do the will of his Father. He was not distracted by the barriers or the boundaries. He was only interested in doing God's will. And it can, so, or it can be easy to become distracted by the social barriers or the cultural boundaries uh, that, that is, is created in our secularized culture. And it can be easy to succumb to different excuses. So like Jesus tonight, I pray that excuses would not keep us from doing the will of the Father. So uh, 
as we walk uh, these halls and walk these classrooms and pray over our buses, I want us to pray this second prayer point tonight. Father, may your will be done in us and through us as we work to bring in the harvest. And lastly, as we work to bring in the harvest, church, as we work to be about the mission of the church, we are going to need to be dependent upon God's power that he has given us to complete the mission. We talked about this this morning in service. We're going to pray about it tonight. Jesus' church is a missional church. It's also an empowered church. Church, we need God's Spirit to flood these hallways, classrooms, and buses. So prayer point number three is this. Father, pour out your Holy Spirit upon every ministry space, upon every minister. Fill your people with the power of your Holy Spirit. And as we pray that, would you be open and receptive to receive what God has for you tonight? Can we stand across this place? We're going to come back here at 10 minutes till 7. So watch your clocks, maybe set a timer on your cell phone. Youth, I want to meet with you guys in room 11. Mason, you know where that's at. So middle school, high school, I'm going to meet with you guys in room 11 while we're doing this. I want to talk to you guys specifically on a couple of things. But Jake, we're going to get some music going. Don, we're going to get some music going. And that music will be playing quietly in the hallways and such. But church, I want us to pray over every chair. I want us to pray over every classroom. I want us to pray over every square inch of this building tonight and the grounds. I want us to believe God to fill this place with His power and with His Spirit. Church, we cannot do this without Him. Nor should we want to. Amen? So here in a moment, I'm going to pray and I'm going to release you. Will you help me flood this place with prayer? Will you help me flood those buses with prayer? Will you help me cover the parking lot in prayer, the fire pit area in prayer, the, 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 the playground in prayer, even the lawnmower, Larry? Pray for that lawnmower and the guy that rides on it, please. I want us to anoint this place. I want us to ask God to anoint this place tonight. Will you help me in doing that? Father, we thank you for what you're doing in this place. and We recognize the call that the harvest is ready to be brought in. And as we dedicate this building, and as we dedicate every square inch of this property to your service tonight, I pray, Spirit, that you would guide us, lead us, and direct us in our time of pursuing you. May the miracles begin now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.